Welcome to the Leading Movement Health Series. I'm your host, Phil Wagner, founder and CEO of Sparta Science. And today's guest, Sergeant Major Michael Grinson, recently retired as a Sergeant Major of the Army. And that role is the public face of the Army's non-commissioned officers. It's the representative to the people in the media, in business, in community engagements. But Tony also spent 36 years serving in the Army, and he held every enlisted leadership position in artillery and, set, and did seven deployments. And his military education is equally vast. Ranger school, drill sergeant schooler, air assault, airborne. And I bring that up because a crucial aspect of leadership is credibility and empathy. Do you understand the situation your people are in? Another is service. And Tony now is the director and CEO of Army Emergency Relief, the official nonprofit of the Army. And one of the reasons I'm super excited to have Tony join us today is, is one of these principles he's talked about in the past that we'll dive into is, this is my squad. And so I'm, I'm super excited and, and, and grateful to, for you to be joining us. So welcome, Tony. Hey, thanks, Phil. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here, and I love this topic. Yeah, yeah. we talked about it briefly before. I mean, you know, this this is my squad on the surface seems very concrete and simple, but a lot like a lot of great leadership principles, there's layers to this, you know, and so how does this is my squad, you know, really play a role and impact the goal of readiness, you know, for your squad, your team, in this case, the U.S. Army? Yeah, I, I think you're right. It's got like multiple layers. It can be applied not just to the Army. Um, it can be applied to my new job here at, you know, AER as the CEO of AER. So when most people heard this is my squad. They thought infantry squad, maybe even like you said, you know, this is to the army. And I would disagree with that. Um, it's got multiple layers, extremely complex. It's a simple concept, but it's very complex and has multiple layers. Kind of like me, you know, we got different yep. layers. Um, you know, people say, you know, what are we going to call you now? I said, Tony's good. <laughs> so, um, yep. and how does that apply to my squad? Is like, you have more than one squad you can be a member of. And and you have different roles in that squad. And do I always want to be the Sergeant Major in the Army? Um, that would have been cool, but you know that's not the job that I have now. So the job they have now is the CEO of AER, and that's a new role. And I have to adapt to that. And I have a new squad. I have people that I need to take care of, and I need to evolve and get better in my new role. And if I don't do that, I'm not going to ever change. I'll get stuck in what I've done in the past. And that's not what the army needs to do. That's not what I need to do. Um, and I think even in a relationship, when you look at a squad that, you know, my wife is another squad, uh, my family, and that relationship has to evolve for the better. I mean, people change over time. And if you don't evolve with that, you're just not going to be, uh, the army won't be as ready as they should be. And you won't take care of each other. The whole point of the squad is just knowing the people around you um, and knowing who they are, not just uh, a person that comes to work, not just a soldier that comes up and shows a PT, but knowing all those other layers that I just talked about. They're a father, they could be a son, they could be a brother, and that's just me. <laughs> so uh, that's all the, you know, the, the layers behind me. And do you know all that? And I think when you know all that about the people around you, whether you're in the Army or you're not, you can employ them better. Hmm. When I know my squad and I know uh, these things are going on in their life, I go, wait a minute, let's go. We might need to solve something that's, you know, bothering somebody at home. That way we have a more ready Army. You know, so if, I, if I can make sure that they're taken care of at home, then when we deploy, I don't have to worry about that. But if I don't even know that and they don't trust me enough to tell me that in the army um, and then I'm walking on that patrol, that can be like super dangerous. They're not paying attention, you know, and, you know, I don't need to give a class on IEDs, but, you know, you don't, you know, you're looking down and, and you're thinking about what's going on at home. And uh, and I was a squad leader and I didn't even know that. Hmm. Uh, what kind of leader you know, would I be if I didn't know those things? So. It's so complex, um, but the basic idea of my squad really is just knowing the people around you. They have multiple layers, 
And do they trust you enough? If you're the leader, do you do they trust you enough to share those other layers with you? Mm-hmm. And if you're the leader, are you do you trust your squad enough to let them know about your other layers? Mm-hmm. Um, and we always think, you know, higher to lower, like the soldiers got to tell me what's going on. But are you willing to tell them what goes on with you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, very complex because <laughs> hey, it, yeah. you know, it's like, oh, wait a minute. You can tell me all this stuff, but I can't tell you what's going on in my life because, you know, I'm in charge. I'm I'm perfect. I'm mm-hmm. the sergeant of the army. I have no issues. <laughs> right. Right. And that's all you do. Right. That's all I do is the army. Right. But your yeah, life, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your you life is far more complex than just the SMA role, just the army. Right. I, I love just how you're talking about the the agility that allows you to both focus. Okay. I'm in this squad right now, but now I've gone home. Now I'm in this squad. Right. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, um, and, and, and you could be the squad leader or you'd be a squad member. <laughs> so it's like, right. so one squad, you know, when I go in the office, you know, my immediate office is the Sergeant Major Army. I think in that office, I, in, in my office, I was the squad leader. Hmm. But when I walked out, now this is, you know, really complex, right? And I walk in the hallway um, and I'm going to the chief's office. I'm now a squad member. So you, it's not even um, the concept, even, even just walking and going from army to home, you know, because, oh, OK, well, now, yeah, I get that. But what about if I'm a uh, squad, a, literally now a, a rifle squad leader? You know, I'm in my squad. I am the squad leader. But when I'm with the platoon, I'm a member of the squad. My other squad leaders could be my squad mates. Uh, and the platoon sergeant might be the squad leader or the platoon leader. And it's like, oh, he's the platoon leader. I said, well, you're you're not getting this concept of a squad. <laughs> it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't mean like a rifle squad. It's those people that know you. And then how do you lead in some situations? And when is it a good time to be a follower? in those situations. Um, and some people really can't transition that well. And I think it hurts their leadership skills sometimes. Yeah. I guess, and to use a, a military term, right. It's the situational awareness, right. Of what situation yeah. you're in and then what role in that squad are you playing? Right. Yeah. I mean, if you go and act like, uh, well, that wouldn't work in my house. So if you go home, you know, you go you know, start bossing everybody around. Um, <laughs> You know, it doesn't work. So last night, I have to tell the story on myself. Again. So yeah. last night, and it was a little taken out of context. Uh, my wife said, you know, did you tell me about, you know, something that she wanted me to cook? And I said, I told you, you know, and she goes, did you write it down? I said, well, verbal commands are still commands. <laughs> oh, man, that did not go well. <laughs> I think I think my daughter went and got her phone and started writing that down. Daddy told mommy verbal. Oh, I'm yeah. like, no, what I meant was <laughs> I tried to bring those words back in. And um, yeah, so uh, I was not uh, a good squad mate at that moment. Yep. Um, last night. <laughs> it, was, it was, oh, it did not go well. Um, yeah, so, I bet. Uh, yeah, so you have to evolve when you um, say these things as a squad member of the member of my, in my squad and my family. And what works in one squad clearly won't work sometimes in other squads. Hmm. Yeah. And I think uh, as, you know, we, as, as we think and talk about things like H2F where there's multiple pillars, right. And, and part of that is, is your home life, your family life and your spiritual life. It's, it, that's where I think this concept really plays too, because you have to really round out the soldier, round out the individual. Right. And, and this, this is my squad, that situational awareness play such a critical piece to that yeah um and then and i really like putting those two together the my squad and holistic health and fitness and we when we look at holistic health and fitness we really most people in their mind somehow imagine like one pillar like right. the physical fitness right and i think not i think i still truly believe the most important thing about just the physical fitness is the mental fitness i don't think if you're meant if you're not mentally strong you can't be physically strong it's hard to get up and and work out every day and that's a mental toughness uh to get up at five o'clock and i think this morning it was like 28 degrees and you know and good news i still ran so everybody it's okay i'm still here Uh, so uh i ran about seven and a half miles 
but it's mental toughness to get you out the door. It's cold. I don't have to. I'm not in the army anymore. I could just sleep in. Uh, but I want to stay fit. I want to be healthy. I want to be active. Uh, so I think the mental toughness is a you know a big part of that. But when people think health, wellness, health, and fitness, they go straight for the physical. They don't right. even think the mental. And then, like you said, that spiritual man. Let's let's believe in something bigger than ourselves. Mm. Um, you know for the greater good. And what we found is those that actually have this connection that it, there is something, you know, bigger than ourselves, you know, they uh, have less suicide rate. Hmm. Um, there's a, I can't remember. I think it's Dr. Kramer is her name. Uh, she wrote a book on this and just like had statistics uh, about how important this belief in something um, outside, you know, yourself is how important that is. And then of course, the last thing is the sleep. And um, and it's not the last. I know there's more pillars, but this the thing about sleep is, and I love the army, it's like this, it's almost like this badge. Um, it's like, hey, I slept four hours. Oh, really? I slept three hours. You know, it's like right. and I was like, okay, well, are you mentally working with all the capabilities that you can? And then let's tie that to my squad. And then can you be either a good role model for your squad and get enough sleep um, and then set that example? And I think we don't. Um, and it's like this badge of honor or toughness. I have seen it too many times in combat where people will, you know, hey, I stayed up all night. And I said, well, well, when you're making those decisions, life or death, these are literally life or death decisions. You're not using your full mental capacity. When you're sleep deprived, it's just like being drunk. Um, there's plenty of studies on this, but right. we had this badge like, yeah, I did it. You know, what's, and what bothers me even more is, um, when we look back at a situation and we'll go, oh, let's do an investigation and we'll all be sitting here and we all do it. And, you know, I've been probably accused of this too. And we look around, I can't believe they did that. Well, they probably were sleep deprived. We're all well rested. We had a good night meal, you know, and now we're looking at it like, oh, I can't believe they did that. But they were sleep deprived. They were under a very stressful situation. And I think we have to remember that when we put our because we, we always go back and look at these things in combat and then we judge them. And I go, well, you weren't there and you don't know what led up to that. I mean, imagine that they, you know, they didn't have any sleep because they were attacked all night and they made a bad decision. And then we are sitting here. Going, oh, I can't believe they did that. But more importantly, let's tie that back to the, the squad is. Was there somebody there that could have helped them? Was there a squad mate that knew they were tired? Um, was that at the battalion level? Was that somebody else to say, we need to stop because I think they're not, you know, I don't think they're operating on all cylinders. So that squad has to be able to challenge each other and say, hey, stop. And maybe hopefully somebody in there can say this is dangerous or it's, you know, we need to take more time. Now, I know in combat, sometimes you can't always do that, but I found us when we go back and study some of these things that may have been gone wrong or bad poorly in combat, we'll judge them. Uh, and I think um, we're not looking through it through the right lens. Yeah, no, I think that's very uh, astute, you know, to, yeah, make sure that when we do these, yeah, for, for lack of a better word, after action reviews, that they're looked at in the right lens of what's the context. You know, and I think, you know, a lot of times, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, how this is my squad can be a better lens to look at. And, you know, as we think about other things, and, and I completely agree that H2F and the physical pillar have become overly synonymous, like the same thing. Um, and one of the reasons is it's much easier to measure the physical piece, you know, oh, and, yeah. and, and, and I know a lot of times leadership tenants and leaders in general are, are stressed when there's challenges. And one of the challenges you know, you, you were faced with was implementing and this, this new army combat fitness test, right. Which took you know, <laughs> almost 40 years, right. And um, to, to start to revamp and implement. And even then there were um, critics of like, Hey, maybe we shouldn't do this. Maybe the tests are wrong. Maybe the standards are wrong. We should roll this all back. Right. And, yeah. you know, when you talk about this is my squad, how does, how does like a, a leadership principle like that help you be able to, to weather and overcome some of these um, types of challenges that come with leadership, right? 
Yeah, I could tell you, I I could not have made it as the Sergeant Major of the Army without a great squad. Um, I'm I'm being honest with you. I mean, there was a lot of things going on. Let's yeah. pull that back. Uh, you know, 2019, we still had a lot of soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we had uh, soldiers. I felt like every other week, uh, soldiers were dying in combat um, in 2019. So as the Sergeant Major Army went up, you know, a soldier died in combat, they fly back to Dover, I would always go up. Uh, if I was physically in D.C., didn't matter what time, what day. Um, I was I was there, so we were always doing that. Then you, And then we started to have COVID. We killed so many. I mean, then you had hurricanes, fortifiers, COVID, civil unrest, you name it, Fort Hood. Um, I, I just, I had a great squad. And uh, one of those squad mates was Sergeant Major Albertson, former 75th Ranger Regiment guy, 10th Mountain Division, 18th Airborne Force Sergeant Major was my executive officer. And I couldn't have picked uh, a better person in, in probably all the Army to help us through that time. Um, man, I don't know. Without them, I don't know what I'd done. I'd probably just like, okay, uh, I've been a, I'd probably in a mental institution um, because it really took a whole thought. I mean, as frustrated I'd get and, you know, with, you know, trying to get the new ACFT. And like you said, there was there was constantly somebody saying, no, 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 let's do this. Let's go with that. If you talk to 10 people in the Pentagon, I don't care who, you pick 10 on the ACFT, you'd have 10 different opinions. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, right. I appreciated them all, by the way. Um, <laughs> not yeah. really. But, um, um, but to get it done was, uh, it took an effort uh, from uh, not just my office, the whole army, uh, but man, that was, it, it was extremely challenging during a challenging time. And, and, you know, you had this one plate, you'd spend the, you know, the ACFT plate and then you had to, oh my goodness, what's going on at Fort Hood? Oh, we got the silver unrest thing. Oh wait, we got COVID. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. You name it. It was all over the place. And without having a really solid uh, office, um, man, that would have been tough. I, I I couldn't have done it. I, I mean, I'll just be honest with you. It takes a yeah. it takes a team, and I just talked about one of those teammates I had. But um, I, I I don't think I would have got anything done if I didn't have a great office. I mean, I don't know how to put it any other way. And yeah. and not just office, but uh, you talk about the force comms star major, the trade ops star major, the and all of them um, getting together talking about this stuff to to help us get these things done. It, it was an incredible effort, and it, it took a it took a lot of people and a lot of teammates to do it. Yeah, and I think there's a couple words you mentioned in there. It, it reminds me, uh, I'm based out in the Silicon Valley, and there's a lot of tech companies that have a big poster on the wall that say done is better than perfect. You know, with this yeah. idea that, hey, if we're trying to build innovation and products that are perfect, right, we're never going to complete anything, right? If we're, if we're chasing this, uh, you know, AC, perfect ACFT, <laughs> and and you're holding up this it always seems impossible until it's done that's right right i mean if we <laughs> if, if we if we're constantly trying to make it perfect right we're never really going to get anything done but, but that's where i think to your point having that tight squad you know to to help and hold each other accountable really allows you to endure challenges right that to get things done yeah, that that whole concept of um, uh, perfection uh, versus good enough, really. Mm. Um, you know, there's a book I just finished reading. I think it's A Minute to Think by Juliet Funt. Um, very good. And it actually talks about, you know, this thief of time, you know, and the time thief says, I'm going for perfection when really what I need is good enough. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's time a, thief, yeah. Yeah, you you can you can get to you can just keep going after perfection because you want it just to be perfect. Um, and you know, last time I checked, uh, perfection doesn't exist. <laughs> so yeah, uh, so you know, just sometimes, and even with ACFT, you know, I was like, that's not perfect. Okay, nothing's perfect. <laughs> right. um, and like I said, ten people down the hallway in the Pentagon we had 10 different versions of what perfect would be anyway. Mm. So um, I think, and I'm not saying the ACFT is good enough. Like it's a bad thing. It's a very good assessment of physical fitness. Mm. Um, and but, it's better than before. Right. Oh, so <laughs> right, what's the, <laughs> let's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's not, 
it better than before. Then you know what, you know, push up setups and a run. And it's just a, you know, two aspects of, you know, physical fitness as opposed to like all of them. <laughs> yeah, so right, like, right. Uh you know, yeah, it's like um like we were saying before, it's like, yeah, you know, that's like going from the glider to a C seventeen. So yeah, yeah, it's a little bit better. <laughs> a lot better. Um uh and, you know, here's another funny, it's like you know, a lot of people kept talking about the men. And I thought about this, I guess, after clear thought and a little bit more sleep as, you know, as I retired. And the men, the men, it was like the men, the men. You know, I, I just remember being a soldier for 36 years. I never talked about the minimum score of what was on the physical fitness test. That's, I was like, only if I was, you know, wanting to chapter somebody out. But um, everything else, uh, when I was a squad leader, <laughs> so, was all about the maximum. Like, mm. how do I achieve the, the, the best, you know, can I get the, the 300, the 600 and what do I need to do that? And how do I get my unit to achieve a 300, 600? Um, I, it was very, very rare that I was like, oh, let's, let's go look up the men. Let's go look and see how we can do the bare minimum. <laughs> it's like, right. Right. It's, it's a, like, yeah, uh, it's a great point. It's a great point. Why, why is organizations, you know, do, do we, we get overly concerned with um, the the minimum bar, right? Why aren't we striving for the maximum, right? Uh, you know, achievement and 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 be less concerned about what's the the minimal requirement. Yeah, it's like um, I, my I guess again, let's go back to that mental aspect of it. I would be concerned about a leader that comes in and walks in. You know, I walk into AER and say, "Hey, you know what? This is what I want to do. I want to do the bare minimum." <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, I'd probably be fired. I, I don't think I've been hired. Uh, like, who does that? I mean, you know, no, you said, hey, I want to achieve more than what I've done in the past. And we want to go up to uh, the maximum amount that we can help our soldiers, whatever that, you know, like, I think that's the attitude. I would be concerned about the organization that comes in and says, OK, let's go look up those men's standards and make sure, you know, we just do the bare minimum. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I that applies to any organization, right? As a business, hey, let's make sure we don't lose money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Or yeah. as a hospital, let's make sure the patient doesn't get any sicker. Right. <laughs> like, I mean, I think that organizationally is such an important concept of of not settling. Right. But really trying to thrive. Yeah. It's like you want to achieve more and the highest. Uh, and that's the attitude. Um we would have in physical fitness and your mental fitness and your life. You don't, you know, want to go, well, you know, I just want to make sure I have the minimum, you know, for my children. And you do, you want to have, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You, right. you got to have the basic needs. If, you know, if those aren't met, then, you know, you can try for all the stuff in the world. You know, you always go back basic needs first, but once you get that, you, you go up and then you'll go up again. And that's, you know, that's the hierarchy of needs. It just keeps going up until right. you get self-actualization. Um, and that's how human beings are. And I think uh, when you look at the the physical fitness, it's the same thing. It's like, yeah, we had a minimum, but that should be the last thing you could look at. Mm-hmm. And, and and so what we did was we set the bar really high for those maximum standards. They were not easy at all. <laughs> so um, I don't think... Neither's combat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, 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 don't get me started. <laughs> yeah. See, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Combat's right. hard. And it's, right. uh, yeah. Um, and the bar may be, the bar there is really high, it, you know, cause it could be death, you know, and that's, uh, that's not a bar you want to, to get to. And you gotta be, you know, at the highest peak. And I tell you, you know, physical fitness and combat, um, my philosophy was I never wanted to be, um, uh, either myself or my soldiers put in harm's way because I wasn't fit enough. Mm. And I'll give you a story about this. People are like, what do you mean? Well, for those that may not have gone to combat, um, and there's a lot, and it's not good or bad, even the army or out of the army. Um, but here's this thing, I still remember, I am a um, battalion sergeant major, so I'm, I'm not 20, you know, I'm say, I think I was probably 37, maybe 35, 37, somewhere around there. Um, and we're going on a patrol and I'll, I'll tell you, I'll visualize this patrol. We have, um, Iraqis out there. Um, we're doing a joint patrol with Iraqi army 
and we're on this really bad area of Iraq. It's really bad. Triangle of Death. There's a couple of books on it. Read about it. And that's where we're at. Um, I think there had been a Iraqi that would just been killed. Now we're on the patrol and, you know, uh, there's a helicopter, you know, coming in, doing this scraping move. Uh, you got all these things going on. I get out and we dismount and we're going to start walking and we start moving away from our vehicles. Uh, so we're doing a Kazavak. We have Iraqi killed. Um, now we're moving. Now we're about five kilometers away from our vehicles. It's really hot. My vehicle had moved up you know, explosion happened behind it. So uh, thank God I'm alive because I, I think I literally got out over a, a bomb and I just got lucky and I moved. So now we're 10 kilometers out and a soldier comes to me and says, I don't think I can keep moving. I'm like, what? I'm like, what do you mean? Like moving? Like, yeah, you know, my legs hurt. I can't walk. I mean, I'm tired. I'm like, okay, you know, if you can't keep moving, you know, you just heard all that stuff, you know, this, you're right, going to die. Right. You know, like, right. I, you know, so I'm like, man, you know, so I, I said, man, what are we going to do? I mean, we're 10 kilometers out. It's not like, hey, let's go and pick this guy up. He's not injured. He's not. I mean, do we put a helicopter at risk to get a kid who can't walk because he's tired? Um, right. Yeah, that's not happening. So I I thought the only thing I could do is I said, I'll take all your equipment. Um you know, so uh, here I am, the battalion sergeant major. We're we're ten kilometers away from the vehicles, and I just take his rucksack. I take he's the saw gunner. I take all his ammo, everything, and I carry it for him. And uh, the good news is we made it back. And but imagine, you know, that's the physical uh, fitness that you need to be ready for. And if you're not there at that level, you know, you put others at risk. Um, and that story stuck in my mind as I try to get the new ACFT. Uh, don't think about the minimums. Think about combat. It's really hard. And yes, the PT test is really hard. And we got to go for the max because you don't want to be out there and you want to be the one that says, hey, I can't keep walking because I can't carry my equipment. Mm -hmm. And you put the whole squad at risk. Uh, so, yeah, there's your story about physical fitness in combat. Yeah. And, and how it relates, you know, to the other pillars like like mental, you know, the mental health, the mental strength of an individual and how physical health plays a role in that. Because a lot of times these fitness tests are more about grit than actual physiology, right? Or are you able to actually endure some of the challenges in a non-combat setting mentally um, more than yeah. just the pure physiological VO2 max, you know, strength, you know, it's also just, can you just overcome the discomfort that's going to potentially be seen in combat? Yeah, and I think that's uh, one of those aspects of uh, Ranger School. You know, a lot of people talk about Ranger School, and uh, it's just one of those leadership schools that puts you through a mental and physical toughness. And can you, when you're physically down, can you keep moving mentally? And can you mentally get past this really sleep-deprived, no food, cold, wet, rainy, bad, all of it? And then keep moving somehow uh, mentally. He's like, okay, I don't know how I'm going to get up right now, but sure. Um, and I think that's one of those aspects. And, and there's a lot of things, uh, you know, the army has that puts you through those uh, ringers so that when you do get to combat, you, you go, okay, um, it's not exactly the same, but I've been in this stress and how can I keep operating mentally? You know, uh, because you're right. When you get to that threshold, uh, you, I think the human body can endure a lot more than we think they can. So mentally we go, oh, well, I got to quit. This hurts a little. And in all reality, you probably could keep going a little. Hmm. Yeah, well said. Yeah, and I want to be respectful of, of, of time here. And I think at the end, you know, try to kind of summarize, you know, the leaders, you know, what, one of their core tenets. And in this case, you know, this is my squad. I think one aspect that I've learned is, we all have different squads, right? It's not just, you know, if in the military sense, it's not just your, your unit or in the business sense, it's not just your business, right? It's, it's, you know, your there's a squad for your wife, your marriage, your, your family. Um, and then the other piece within the second piece is within that squad. Sometimes you're going to play different roles, right? Use some great examples of being a squad leader versus a squad member. And I think the third takeaway I really am coming away with is, 
when you do lead and work with that squad, really focusing on thriving and not surviving, right? Not not being focused on the minimum, but being focused more on the maximum and and thriving within that. Yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think um I think the other thing that didn't come out that we talked about is the we kind of talked about it is like you said, trust. In there there's a lot of trust. Um I've seen a lot of leaders um you've got to set they don't set the example you have to set the example Hmm. um if if you want the soldiers to tell you about their lives you have to tell them about your life Hmm. um and that comes at risk because as a leader people want to judge you for whatever reasons so uh, the basic premise of that is trust Hmm. and i think in my squad, if I trust you, I'll open up uh, and we can have a really good candid conversation about my strengths and my weaknesses. And that makes us better as a squad. It makes us better as human beings. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's uh, the only other aspect that I'd add to it. There comes with a lot of trust. Uh, when you have a great squad, you trust each other, good and bad. Um, and they're very effective in readiness and business and everywhere else. Yes. And and verbal verbal command is not not a command at home is is probably another takeaway for all of us that are married. Yeah, um, yeah. the word command <laughs> was, uh, was really the bad no, part well. of that. So uh, if you're listening, the C word, yeah, yeah, don't say that <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, like, yes. Oh, so bad, so bad. <laughs> That's a. Yeah. I hope she doesn't listen. And just yeah. like, yeah, hey, I'll get yelled at again. So thanks, yeah. thanks, Phil. Mm-hmm.